Welcome to Dead Headspace, part of Silver Shamrock's Horrorcast, a podcast network that includes killing time with Silver Shamrock and Unburying the Dead, where we exhume classic horror paperbacks for the new generation. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Ghana, YouTube, and all other major platforms. I'm your host, Patrick R. McDonough, joined always by my co-host, Brennan LaFaro. Say hi, Brennan. Hello, everybody. And today we're talking with the author of the 37th Mandala and writer and level designer of the classic PC game Half-Life and their sequels, Mark Laidlaw. Say hi, Mark. Hello, everybody. Did I get the pronunciation correct, Mandala? Yeah, yeah, 37th okay. Mandala. I've, people pronounce it differently. That was your first horror novel, wasn't it? No, um... Oh, I nailed it, damn it. I, that's all right. Uh, Orchid Eater is pretty much a horror novel, too. Uh, I mean, more of a psycho-thriller horror novel, but 37th Mandala is like the big supernatural cosmic horror one. Mm. That's the one most people know. What got you into horror? Uh, gee, well, I mean, when I was a kid, I always think of this. My dad used to read us some... Um, Things like The Pit and the Pendulum and The Black Cat, Telltale Heart, just when we were going off to sleep. (laughs) So um, that kind of gave me a taste for it, I guess. Uh, I don't know. I always loved horror stories. I always wrote horror stories. um, At one point, I found uh, like old mimeographed or ditto copies of like the school English class newspapers that we put out and there my story was always involved haunted houses and bloody daggers and you know kids who mysteriously disappear things like that so it kind of was the impulse from from the start i think yeah and and you know poe and fairy tales and all kinds of stuff that was scary i just always gravitated toward that that's pretty neat. Brennan, you got anything on? I feel like you got a question. I'm, I'm so Poe. curious, you know, if if get, having Poe read to you before bedtime or, you know, because some of those fairy tales, especially the uh, uh, the ones that haven't been altered over time, uh, those are just as horrifying as the pit and yeah. the pendulum. Is that yeah. something that kept you from sleep or something that uh, or, or do you react a different way? I had good nightmares, but I'm not sure that they were just based on that. But I remember vividly um, uh, the telltale heart just lying there in the dark pretty much as my dad read these stories and picturing the blue eye, like the description of the eye in that story when he's sneaking into the room to kill the guy and he thinks the eye is staring at him. And that was an image I remember vividly trying to go off to sleep with that image in my head. I mean, as much as the heart under the floorboards or anything else i that's the one that comes back, back to me so yeah i'm it certainly uh, spiced up the the nightmares a bit <laughs> i gotta ask are you a fan of lovecraft or any of the older uh uh Algernon blackwood or uh, oh, sure. was it mr james sure sure all those guys yeah read all Could, of them yeah because uh, uh we can jump back to Slater, but I'm just thinking like as an adult playing Half-Life, I'm I'm trying to like go through your bibliography and reading some stuff about you. And it it seems like there's a lot of mixes of pop culture and old literature in there. Um but I gotta imagine that's kind of how your older novels are as well. Well, I mean Half-Life the influences are from all the people on the team bringing stuff in. So, uh, and, and most of the crew there was quite a bit younger than I was. So I, my influence, um, you know, came out of conversation with those guys, but a lot of stuff in there just represents what a lot of different people were interested in. Um, I did always, when I had a chance, kind of bring it back to stuff that I was interested in, which, you know, manifests through the writing, uh, as much as anything, but um, I don't, I don't know. the The influences there were a lot of movies and and other games, things like that. But I mean, those the the old weird fiction writers were always an influence, kind of in the background of of 
you know, my own reading and my own interest anyway. So I'm sure it creeps through. Um, Was Alien one of them? Well, uh, Alien, every single game, every single gamer that I knew, every game designer was obsessed with Alien. It was like those were the big ones of the game industry. Maybe less so now, but you know, I mean, when I got into the industry, it was Alien and Aliens and Blade Runner. And um, they were kind of the, just the, the, mov- the few movies that everybody had seen. And when you talked about science fiction or you talked about specifically science fiction horror, those were the things that came up, Event Horizon and Alien and, and The Mist. And, the, you know, every, the things, the easiest thing to agree on with everybody was the movies because everybody had seen the same movies. Mm. So um, I think you see that in a lot of games, uh, a lot of Alien fans. And to the extent that Doom was originally supposed to be a licensed uh, alien property, I didn't and because know that. that because that fell through, they just made Doom. They did their <laughs> own. They made did their own franchise. So yeah, I mean, you see the influence there everywhere, and to the extent that um, I could guide stuff, I tried to kind of move away from that. Just like, hey guys, there's more out there than uh, Alien and Blade Runner. Um, and in Half-Life, we, you know, did try to get some weirder influences in, in the science fiction to not just be um, doing movie stuff. I mean, for a while, it's kind of the philosophy is um, this has never been done in a game before. Like, things that are tired in movies were exciting and fun and kind of novel in games. Um, if they'd never been done before. But then you get to a point where, okay, movies are becoming more and more, uh, games are becoming more and more like movies. And as the, you know, the um, production values got higher, you could do stuff that looked more movie-like and almost competing kind of with the same, at least in cutscenes, the same kind of storytelling. And instead of doing their own thing, um, I, I thought it was, healthier to kind of move away from that and not try to do the stuff that had been done a million times in movies. Um, because I mean, you could see so many influences in the games where it's like, Oh, this is something that's never been done in a game before. But if you turn this game back into a movie, what you'd be looking at is a bunch of movie things you've already seen in movies before. So alien was definitely one of them. One of the, one of the big ones, but, um, are we, I'm half life started before I got there. So they were smart with some of the initial steps to take steps away from stuff that was too familiar. I mean, the mist was an influence early on, but um, there's a lot of stuff in there that you can't really point to a bunch of movies and go, this is just like some movie that I'd seen. And that helped, that really helped the team kind of stay away from that. Like, there was a sense you could make up new stuff because the stuff that you were looking at every day was not that familiar and everybody was on unfamiliar ground kind of the whole time. What I really love about, um, I just like talking about older games that I grew up with because I'm not, I don't really hear it too often, especially with uh, newer generation uh, gamers. Um, I loved how Half-Life spawned all these mods. Like, I was a huge fan of Counter-Strike. I loved playing Deathmatch, uh, Team Fortress Classic, um, Dave Dave Defeat, I think it was, the World War oh, II yeah. game. Sure. There was this uh, one, um, was it Revolutionary War or Civil War? I can't remember. I think, yeah, Revolutionary War. I can't remember what the name was, but there were so many. Ricochet was one of them. I just remember the Valve store or the Steam store it turned into. That's all I did for like 10 years, man. <laughs> so for anyone that, uh, and we'll get off Half-Life in a, in a minute or so, but for anyone that is into older games, I think that they should explore Half-Life. For me, uh, the first, and I've never actually talked about this on the air, the first novel I ever wrote, it's unpublished. I don't think it'll ever see the light of day, but the first one I wrote, it was 100% inspired from Half-Life, Black Mesa, in my own lab. I just, I love that concept. It's, and Brendan, I don't think, I'm not trying to like throw him under the bus, but I don't think he's 
played it, so I just got to tell him. It's really neat, man. <laughs> like, there's terrible co-host, but, I mean, look, there's a million games out there. But um, it's a regular day. The dude's coming in for his first day at this lab called Black Mesa. And then everything just goes wrong. There's aliens. There's gunfire. There's head crabs, like, uh, jumping on people and killing them. It, it's just, it's wild. And for back then... Mark, I want to know if I'm saying anything correct. Please correct me if I'm saying something wrong. But it was neat because Half-Life did something other games didn't do, which was there's really no cutscenes. I don't there were very few. You were playing everything with this guy named Gordon Freeman and uh he didn't talk, which I thought was also neat. So this is my longboat way of saying it's a game worth looking into the history of. Um so I thank you for that, Mark. I wanted to say that on here sure. because uh, I didn't even yeah, I, think. I, 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 it's kind of a hard, like a lot of old games, it's kind of hard to go back and play them and have the experience of what it was like to play them when they first came out. Because, yeah. in, you know, in your mind, I've done this so many times, I, I go back to a game that I love. And then in my mind, the, it's like high res and plays smoothly. And it's this whole experience that I'm remembering a lot of which is just memory of it. And, and at the time, I, you can't ever quite go back to that. You're suddenly like, oh, this looks terrible and the controls are horrible. So over time, there have been attempts made to kind of update it and make it playable for people now. Like the, the whole Black Mesa project was, you know, a community mod team that did their own version of Black uh, of Half-Life to kind of make, you know, reinvent it for... Um, people with new systems and people who have different expectations of what a game should look like, the higher fidelity and stuff. But um, I don't know some, if you want to, it's like going into an antique store at this point, probably not, <laughs> not the old stuff, but vintage. <laughs> yeah. yeah uh, you know, I was playing, um, I hooked up the, I got the N64 and I got just older Nintendo consoles. I'll, I can't get newer ones. I'll, I'll get hooked. And that'll take away writing time. So it's one or the other for me. Yeah, but, it's definitely a, it's a trade off. It, it it's a time suck. I was playing my N sixty four. My friend, when he was over like two years pre plague days, uh, he came over and saw me playing. Me and my wife playing Pokemon Stadium. He's like, "What's wrong with your TV?" I go, "What are you talking <laughs> about? <laughs> That's the quality, man." This is how it's supposed to look. It's insane. So let's move on to. Um, I'd actually really love to hear. Oh wait, actually, I'm sorry. You know what, man? I, I want to jump in real quick if you don't mind. Um, I I have to say I really like the idea. You know, because around the time you know this comes out, the late '90s, we really did start to see video games move from uh, to 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 more you know storytelling based. You know, you could certainly play through games before then, but there wasn't a ton of meat to the story. You know, it was just fun to do. Um, but I, I still dig the idea that, you know, Half-Life had the kind of minimalized cut scenes or, you know, uh, because I'm a big believer in, you know, using the proper media to tell the story. Um, if, if your video game is 90% cut scenes, you know, I always remark that you watch an ad for a video game and you look at it, you say, I can't, how, how do I play that? It doesn't look like I can play that. I just have to watch the whole damn thing. Um, you know, that's that's a story that you could tell and probably should tell through a movie or, you know, of course, there are uh, stories that can and should be told through books. So I wonder how you approach that with, with Half-Life, designing a story that's specifically to be played, not to be watched. Well, at the time, um, you're right. Nobody had quite done the first person shooter in that way where you're delivering an entire story without cutscenes or interruptions and you just kind of lot you're carried along in the narrative the whole time. Um, I, because I didn't play, I don't, I don't have my history with games doesn't go back as far as a, a lot of the people I worked with. So I, I wouldn't say that the games before I discovered games had no stories because I know a lot of um, people just had a very deep, connections with the games they played when they were younger and partly the story and 
in the worlds and all that. I, the thing that sort of attracted me to games, but I came to that pretty late. Um, but the most exciting thing to me right at that time, like in the mid nineties was, uh, the first person experience, first person shooter. And it was, you know, it was quake and doom. It was, um, a medium that felt a lot like comics had been in the early days. Like, uh, it was shit on a lot by, for, for being, you know, um, like immature medium or whatever. It didn't take itself seriously. And that to me was really interesting. And I just saw tons of potential for certain kind of narrative techniques and stuff that you could do in that form. The narrative of the first person shooter at that time was really interesting. And it seemed to be, it was the place to be. And it was all the things that interested me about games and storytelling <clears throat> were kind of becoming possible for the first time. Um, at one point I saw an old, uh, like an early document for, um, <clears throat> I guess it was, I can't remember if it was Doom or Quake. It might've been, I think it was Doom though. There was an early document, um, that id put out, <clears throat> which was sort of screenplay like, and clearly they were wanting to do something like Half-Life. But the technology and everything was not mature enough for it yet. <clears throat> I mean, they had kind of designed the same thing where the story goes in and out of levels and the levels are designed to give you this full sort of novelistic experience. Um, but they couldn't have pulled it off. I mean, <clears throat> but I remember reading this and just seeing the level of ambition that people had uh, where the technology didn't allow them to get there. So they did what they could. And I think in some ways we were just lucky that, uh, you know, the tools and, and the tech and, and the people playing games were, were ready for that kind of thing when it happened. Um, but again, it was on the, you know, on the shoulders of all these other things that had finally come to that point. So, but it was very exciting to me then, um, <clears throat> as time went on, I kind of felt like, I had kind of gotten to the end of the experiments that interested me about that kind of storytelling and um, got less interested in it. Like it was just this really good timing of where I was at, you know, creatively and uh, in my life and, and where the industry was at and the, the people that I kind of fell in with. All these things just came together, you know, and <clears throat> made it possible. So... Um, and I, and I felt it was more, uh, games, games are compared to movies a lot, but I really felt like what we were trying to do there was kind of more novelistic. It was kind of more like that uninterrupted dream thing. And, um, plus just the scale of it. I mean, a movie being a two hour event versus like a 20 hour event, you kind of had to think about these things in a different way than you would do than, than you would like in, you know, a, a very compressed movie. You wanted to sprawl and um, <clears throat> some of the initial games that I played that have little pieces of this, this kind of storytelling in them where you could see how uh, narrative could be embedded in the world itself. And that's what the level design aspect was really interesting because you would build um, your plot into the world itself. Mm. And, you know, you need to encounter these things in a kind of linear way or circle back to them. And the architecture itself kind of became the storytelling tool of the, you know, the geometry that you built the world out of. You could set up encounters and twists and all that. And you had to do it in the 3D space. And, you know, we did that in the mode of science fiction and horror. But uh, you could have told kind of any kind of story in that way. <clears throat> excuse yeah. me that's pretty neat um you know what i just got one more question on this subject we had a uh, media composer nelson everhart he uh pretty much just worked with acclaim uh late 90s early aughts and we were talking about just what it was like to work 
uh, a claim, and basically, it's he was it was compartmentalized. He didn't really communicate with any other departments. I'm just curious, I guess, for my own sake, at Valve, how was it similar? Or like, what was it like working there day to day? Compared to what now? Like where he was very compartmentalized? Because yeah. oh yeah, <clears throat> we were not compartmentalized at all. I mean, we all. It was a very small company, and <clears throat> everybody talked to everybody. And a lot of times, you were just in the same room with people. Um, you know, so a story idea could turn into a level design idea very quickly. Um, we worked that way a lot. And then at, at one point, um, there was kind of organized redesign where a small group of people got together and things weren't working <clears throat> for the overall game. Uh, it was a little bit too sprawling. And so we kind of pulled everything back in and did some really concentrated design sessions to kind of overhaul it. <clears throat> and then handed those out as more assigned bits of work but um, yeah, it was, I mean, as a writer, I worked with level designers and, you know, we worked with the artists and writers and designers worked together. And when we did voice recording sessions, I know a lot of companies, you would hand off your script to the audio producer and they would go direct a session with voice actors and then someone else would edit that and put it into the game. But um, I was there for all that. I mean, I directed voice sessions and chopped up audio and hooked it up in the in the game and worked with people to get that, you know, get into the levels. Um, so it was I, I know a lot, some of the larger companies are more, you know, structured like that, more departmental. And when you get a certain size, I, I guess you have to. But that wasn't really my experience. OK. Uh, so I'm jumping ahead to something else. This is pretty funny. It is I see your picture, and I see in one tweet it says something about the time that you sent a fake author photo to a Russian game magazine, and that same photo is on a Time magazine cover. Can I hear the story about that? Uh, yeah. I mean, early on, we used to ha get requests from. We did a lot of interviews with game magazines all over the world, and they were just magazines. They didn't really have an internet presence. Um, and there was, there was, we had done company photos and uh, to look all professional. And one of my friends photoshopped another friend's uh, head on onto mine, so he did like the bald version of me. <clears throat> so that's some um, Carl Deckard's head on my face. Um, and I just to, for fun, because I, it was a Russian game magazine, I, I'm like, I'm never going to see these guys. And this was all before Half-Life came out. You know, we had no idea anybody was ever going to pay attention to us after the week after the game shipped. Um, I sent them this, I think I did an interview, like an email interview. And then I sent them that as my, uh, employee photo, my, my <laughs> HR photo. So <clears throat> they used it in in a magazine I probably never saw, and then that got picked up by some game site. I can't remember the one, but it that photo started going around uh, as my actual author photo, which was fine with me. I I thought it was hilarious, and then every now and then we'd get somebody in to do an interview, and they'd be staring at me like clearly wondering. <clears throat> when I grew all the hair back. Uh, and then I think that the best part was at one point there was a, after the game shipped, there was like an interview in one of the game, <clears throat> sort of the industry magazines, had a picture of Gordon Freeman and then that bald head photo of me. <laughs> and we were, we've just laughed at it. It's like these two fictitious characters, like <laughs> it's on the, it, you know, the ones responsible for Half-Life were all fictitious people. That's great. <clears throat> now, I am curious about, I went to college for um, computer electronics, so I, I always, I'm always curious of older computer programming and whatnot, and I did see that you, uh, when you were going to school, it was punch cards for computer programming. I'd love to hear what that really entails, because I don't know a whole lot about that stuff. 
Well, my <clears throat> I didn't have much of a programming career, but I I thought maybe I could learn at one point. So I think I got I got a book on uh, I don't even know what it would have been at the time. Actually, I just had started to got a basic programming book, and at the University of Oregon, the computer center was one one building, <clears throat> and you would um, you go in with your program. And you would type it into the big punch card machine, which they had like in the lobby of the building. And then there was a big desk there and you just hand them your cards and they would take it off to run your program. Or it, it usually what would happen is after three cards, it would crash. So they'd bring your stack of cards back to you and, you know, say you've got a bug with your third card. So back to the drawing board and then you'd try to fix that and punch in another card and now bring them, bring the stack back to them and they'd run it through. And then, you know, you come back in an hour or so and they tell you got a problem with your fourth card. <laughs> so that was the point where I stopped my um, <clears throat> early attempt at programming. And then later I think I tried like Turbo Pascal or something like that when, when I could do, do it on my own uh, computer, but I never got very far at some, you know, in that era, there was no reason, there was nothing I could look at as a program and think, oh, I would like to make that. Like, was I going to make a, you know, accounting software or a word processing program? Um, I, you know, I didn't associate them with games in any way. So not, not a thing I pursued, but I still, every now and then I fool myself into thinking, well, maybe I'll, <clears throat> I'll learn to do some, some programming. I do a little bit and then I hit a wall and I just like, I'll leave this to people who are good at it and just ask them to help me. <laughs> I, don't, I don't blame you. I was taking a C or it was a C plus class and uh, my teacher said the first day. So the thing about being a programmer is that you're going to want to drink a lot because you're, you're going to go crazy if you don't, the more you do <laughs> this. They make a lot of money though. So let's talk about and please tell me if I got this incorrect, the pronunciation, The Adventures of Gorlin Visenfirth Books. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so that in the last few months, um, that's kind of what I have been doing in terms of, um, it's, of writing. Uh, I started writing, I mean, when I was a kid and in high school and stuff, I was a huge fan of Jack Vance and sword and sorcery and, you know, just weird fantasy stories. And I um, started writing <clears throat> about a bard character. I wrote a novel when I was in high school. It was called um, Mistress of Shadows. And it was about a bard, you know, sort of a typical fantasy bard. Gets in trouble with some magicians and ends up having his hand well, initially his finger swapped with that of a gargoyle and um, uh, given a quest. And if he didn't go along with the quest and made bad decisions along the way, the black stone gargoyle finger would creep and take over more and more of his body. So by the end of the book, he ends up with his whole hand is now solid stone <clears throat> through his, um, you know, not sticking to the task. And... Um, he he was just sort of a typical bard fantasy character of but it was in a it was a way that I could imitate Jack Vance and Fritz Lieber and kind of just write in this mode that was sort of purely entertaining, kind of episodic, rambling adventures and it all tied together with a with one overall plot. But um <clears throat> I started to see it as pretty just generic. Um drifted away from that kind of story uh and so somewhere in my early 20s i think i just threw it away um i tried to write it again and then i just gave up and threw it out um and then in my 30s i started kind of wishing i had like a you know a mode of fantasy that i could write in just to kind of enjoy that kind of language it was, a, it was a, there's a fun in um letting yourself write these these kind of more elaborate sentences and um, sort of poetic. And again, my, you know, going back to my love for Jack Vance and this kind of 
uh, inflated <clears throat> language and, and colorful characters. I found myself thinking about that character, uh, Gorlin. And so I wrote another story about him. Um, and then over the next you know, few years, I wrote a few more. And it was kind of like I just was checking back in with this guy that I had known when we were both teenagers. And I was like, well, I'm in a different place in my life now. I wonder where he's at. <clears throat> so um, I, over the years, I wrote um, a bunch of those stories. I wrote nine of them originally over a few decades. And then I wrote what I thought was one last story about um, Gorlin and Visenfurth. And that was called uh, Stillborn. <clears throat> and it was tied together all the characters and it even retold the whole story of the novel that I had thrown away. So I felt that was very done and complete. <clears throat> and that came out in um, uh, fantasy and science fiction. And there was a review of it that said, oh, well, obviously he's brought everything up to a level for the next continuation of the story. And I was like, what? I, I'm done. <clears throat> so I, then I started thinking about it and um, I went, oh, well, maybe I just kind of got all the characters together and I could do a novel now about these guys. So um, <clears throat> I so I wrote the novel, uh, ended up doing that in 2018. And uh, that's underneath the Oversea. And it's kind of the adventures of Gorlin. And at this point, he's got a family. And um, so <clears throat> it's sort of, in, it's it's got a little bit of the Vance flavor, but it's also partly through, I realized that my big fantasy influence at this point is more like Ghibli Studios and Miyazaki. So I kind of went, oh, okay, well, there's like that, has, that's the vibe now that, that I was going for. So <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I wrote that in 2018. Uh, I was living on Kauai at the time and we had this massive so-called rain bomb which dumped four feet of rain in 24 hours on our little neighborhood, wiped out the roads. Um, <clears throat> basically, we were uh, kind of stranded in our neighborhood for 14 months. So I had plenty of time to write. Um, um, so I wrote that and then uh, ended up self-publishing it just last October. And um, <clears throat> so it's Kindle only right now because I couldn't really uh, get myself interested in learning the whole process of, you know, laying out, doing the layout on a book and physical book design. Uh, whereas a Kindle, I can kind of control the quality and it's, it's good enough for an ebook, but, um, <clears throat> my own book design skills, I don't think would lead to a book that I would be proud to, uh, have, you know, to see on people's shelves. So, um, <clears throat> but, but the process of, of publishing it, uh, then I decided to wrap up all the stories that I had written. And I, I had written one more about uh, Gorlin and those guys. So I put those stories together in a collection called The Gargoyles Handbook. And um, they're both on Amazon. <clears throat> they're both Kindle editions at this point. And yeah, Amazon let me call them the uh, Adventures of Gorlin Visenforth. So... Um, they are at this point only Kindle only. And I, I know some people don't like to read eBooks and, um, I would be, have been more than happy if they were, you know, actual physical books, but that <clears throat> it's a strange market right now for fantasy. I, a thing that I, you know, when I was in high school, this the, kind of the model of books that I read, I, that's kind of where I was aiming at was like sort of, you know, standard colorful fantasy novel. Um, but, uh, a lot of, a lot of those things now are, are self-published. So that's where I'm at. <clears throat> On the other hand, uh, it's easy to find. I also put all my old, uh, books on, you know, I self-published those on Kindle. They were out of print for, you know, decades basically. So it's nice that they're in print in some form or another. People are, you know, you can read them.
uh, as an ebook. But um, yeah. I'm I'm really interested in now. This is just my interpretation, so maybe it's completely off base. But when I think of the main character, you know, having that gargoyle finger that you know spreads whenever he you know makes a, a wrong choice. I, I think of that as a great example of kind of setting a clock in your own fiction um, to keep the pace going. And, you know, what kind of throws me off that is that it's a series. So, I mean, it's not you're not going to be pacing it the same as a standalone story. But I wonder if that was a consideration on your part. Well, I think I mean, I'm kind of putting myself back in where I was, what my considerations were when I was 16 or, you know, um, I think I just thought it would be a cool fantasy thing. Um, as I got older, I started to see it as like a, a literalization of, you know, a moral choice. You know, you make a choice and you're stuck with it. Um, and if you shirk your duty and responsibility, you're stuck with that too. So, I mean, I started to see it differently as I got older. Um, <clears throat> initially, it was just a thing. Because my, my model for the stories originally were uh, the Kugel, the clever stories, which were just very episodic and each, you know, each adventure he had didn't necessarily connect to the next. So I needed something that would carry me from one end to the other and kind of get him back on the road toward his destination. And that having this curse on him that if he didn't get back on the road and keep the plot moving forward, then um, life was going to be worse for him. So I... <clears throat> I think that was my thinking at the time was it's a it's a cool way to keep him motivated doing something he has no interest at all in doing. So it turns it into to save the world becomes a matter of like self-preservation. Like if he doesn't take this seriously, then he's, you know, he's going to lose his ability to play his instrument. And in fact, he he doesn't take it all that seriously for a while. But in, in the novel, it was in the first novel that was a big motivator. I think by the time I started doing the stories, it's less visible. It's all kind of more in his background. He's kind of come to terms with this thing. Um, and he understands how it drives him and that he'd better do the right thing more often than not, because he already knows what the consequence of not doing that is. And by the, by the time I started writing the story, it's short stories about him. He was a bit older and he'd kind of learned some of the lessons of the, you know, of the, the original character, the younger character. And he'd obviously made it that far without turning completely to stone, which is a bonus. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I like the cover for the first one. The stones, uh, the cat, cat-shaped cat stones. Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> excuse me. The artist on both of those is uh, Sylvia Ritter. She's uh, an artist on Twitter. Um, and I had seen some of her work, like, uh, you know, I think some of my gamer friends, um, followed her and kept posting her things. And what Sylvia did for the, uh, Gargoyles handbook, <clears throat> she, um, had, would try to find an image from each of the stories and, you know, embed that in the cover somehow. So if you've read the, as you read the stories, it's kind of like a game you can play. You can look at the book and go, Oh, I think this is from that story and this is from that. So the cats are from <clears throat> the cats tie into the story uh catamounts. Um so she she found clever ways to to work in images from the stories. It was really neat. She and then she did a great design for underneath the oversea too. So it was it's one cool thing about um <clears throat> uh designing your own books is you can find some of your favorite artists on Twitter and commission them to do covers for you. <laughs> yeah, it's bring great. Some, bring some new art into the world. Absolutely. What is, for the second cover, what is that? Is that a portal or a black coal? Or... Uh, well, it's sort of a tentacle, but what's what they're, there's a little tiny mini sub kind of thing that's descending on this big, huge undersea volcano, which yeah, was it. a, was a big wizard's um, giant, uh, sort of like a wizard version of a nuclear reactor under sea. Um, mm. And it's just starting to light up. Like it's been, it's been dark and decommissioned for 
eons, and now it's just starting to warm up again. So yeah, she picked one image out of the book and just did this amazing uh, cover with it. That's really neat. Now, of your back catalog, is there one book or two that for newer potential readers that you would advise they start your your bibliography on? Um, well, depending on what you like, I I always just tell people go look at the um, preview on Amazon, which lets you read you know a few chapters of each. Because for me, reading, discovering a book or being recommended a book, uh, it's almost like you like the smell of it. You know, you get a whiff of, from the pros and you go, oh, I want more of that. Or you immediately go, <clears throat> is it, it's not for me. It's almost a, you know, it's, it's very subtle. It's almost a chemical reaction. So I don't, I don't ever recommend anything in particular, but I do recommend that process. Like, go take a look and see, you know, see what you like. And that's what I do when I'm, if I were in a bookstore, I would open a book at random and just, you know, you know, you from the, from the prose itself, if this is something that, that draws you in. Um, One that, sorry, Mark, go ahead. Oh, it's just, you know, there's horror and there's some fantasy and some science fantasy and some sort of satiric uh, black comic SF kind of stuff. So, um, there's a range of things there, but something for everybody. The third force, your novel, the third force, really that cover grabbed my attention. Uh, can you, well, that was based on a game that was all, all about art. Like the, the, that cover cover art from that is taken from that game. Um, and that was when I was just trying to get into the industry, um, and I was reviewing games for Wired Magazine, and I heard about this game, Gadget. <clears throat> and um, it just so happened that my agent, uh, his, his agency also represented the, the guys who created the Gadget game, which was a Japanese studio. Um, and they were trying to cross-market this game and do tie-in books and movies and all the stuff they're trying to create like a whole gadget franchise so it was kind of up for grabs within the agency uh to find a writer who would do a tie-in novel for it and um because it was a game <clears throat> and the game the art from the game immediately uh sucked me in um i kind of tried out for the job and uh luckily got it and then went to Japan and met the team that made the game and I played the game through and they said, you know, we want a book that complements the game. It's not an attempt to just novelize the game, but, you know, something else set in this world. So I had a lot of freedom to just write my own book. Like, it was a game where you played it and, and you could imagine so much more world beyond a little bit of it that you saw. Mm. So that was, writing the book was just the ability to explore all that. But um, that was <clears throat> that was kind of my first step into working with uh, designers. Like at that time, I was interviewing the guys. That, like there was one crazy week where I went to Tokyo and met those guys, and then I came back and I went to uh, Texas and met the guys from ID, and I was writing a profile on them for uh, Wired magazine. So it was like two very different game design groups but both creating you know involved in creating these worlds um and that that was when i knew that was really what i wanted to do so it was just a ex very exciting time but initially being able to tell a story in that world and have the freedom to to start to do that that really fed into being able you know what i was able to do at valve is john cormack is he He's he's fucking smart, man. I've listened to him on interviews. Is he? Uh, is that all that guy talks about? Just like programming and whatnot? Because I can't keep up with a lot of it. Yeah, he's extremely focused on um, on on code. Uh, I don't. I I I met John only you know back then in in the mid '90s. I haven't really run into him since. So I know he's involved in. He's interested in many things at this point, but. 
in those days, yes, he was all about uh, the engine the, and making things run fast. All he knows is he's focused, last I knew, yeah. on virtual reality. There's a profile I wrote about those guys called The Egos at Id that was in Wired Magazine, like in um, 96 or 97, which um, was around the time that I met Valve, the, the guys at Valve. So um, I kind of captured what I what I um, picked up about those guys then. And then actually I that led to um, they invited me to write sort of a company history for the id anthology, <clears throat> which was a it was a big box set that included, I think, doom and quake and a free t-shirt and some you know metal caco demons and stuff like that. and they had a little pamphlet in there that was a supposed to be the company history. And I wrote that up as a kind of a horror story, like a lost pages found from a journal of somebody trying to tell the history of the company as the demons they'd unleashed, like destroyed, came out and destroyed them. So that was fun. I got to know those guys a little bit more from then. Very and, cool. Uh, <clears throat> but ultimately I ended up in, uh, uh, Washington instead of Texas. <laughs> Brendan. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the difference between collaborative storytelling like you'd have in the video game world and kind of more solitary storytelling like writing novels and stories. Well, <clears throat> yeah, I, I miss the team effort. Um, and, and, I really miss working with artists a lot. Like artists and level designers, you feel like um, you don't have to do all the heavy lifting yourself. Like it's really fun to work with somebody who has complementary skills, but you're going for a similar vision, like you're discovering a vision. So it would be just so amazing to sit down and talk about ideas for stories that I could barely make them concrete and then have like a, a, you know, one of my great level designing friends just go off and build a bunch of stuff based on what I was talking about <clears throat> and then throw that back to me. And then we'd start to figure out the next way to integrate. Um, that that's really exciting. And, um, that's not something that you get, you know, working on a, on a, a story or a novel alone. Well, after 20 years of that, I, you know, is more than ready to go. Okay, I'm, I think I can go do my own thing for a while, and and enjoy that. But I, I mean, I like both parts of the process. I look, and and there's things that, you, I mean, to build something at the scale of a, of a, game like Half Life, you need a lot of people, and 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 you need, you know, it's it's a thing not you can't just do alone. So to the extent that that's important to me, I would kind of need to immerse myself in that again. So trying to get back into the thing where there's a different kind of vision that you can bring to something where you, you have control over every aspect of it and the personal nature of that and uh, the ability to follow through on ideas that are maybe too subtle to express in a meeting the, you know, the only way to, to communicate them is to actually write them at length and get them across that way. Um, yeah, total, very different experience, but, you know, both, both great in, in their way. <clears throat> is there any book that you've written in the past or maybe books you have in mind that you want to write eventually that makes you think, I'd like to see that adapted in a video game format? Well, I it's kind of like movies. I I like I like movies that were meant to be movies and <clears throat> games that were meant to be games. I I mean there's obviously books that create deep worlds that would be fun to you know, to explore in a game if somebody literalized them. But when I think about game, I try to think about something that takes the most advantage of being a game. Not something that feels like it was 
you know, a watered down or more amped up version of something that was perfect as a novel. Um, and there's certainly no shortage of ideas for these things. Um, and I, I've, I had, I've had worlds that, um, I thought would be good for game. Like there was a game that I really wanted to make it was sort of a big, weird fantasy game. Um, and when I realized at some point I was never going to make that game and it was not going to happen, I've thought about how to turn it into a novel. But there's things that would be really neat in a game that would just be sort of like generic in a novel, I think. I think it's kind of still that again. It's like, well, this idea, I've never seen this in a game, but I can see the origin of it in you know, a bunch of stories I've read. Um, so do I really want to write stories that are derivative of that if I if I can't do the game? Um, so in terms of my own stuff, probably not. I mean, um, because with a game, you're discovering what other people can contribute to it as well. Uh, also, I mean, in terms of a game, you want something that's fun to play and interesting to play. And that the last thing that I think about there is, oh, what's the world it takes place in? Um, <clears throat> you might have a, a general idea of theme or setting to start you off, but uh, I don't. I don't sit down. I don't usually sit down to play a game for the story. Oh, the world will attract me, but if there's not, you know, like core gameplay that keeps me going. Um, and may, and pulls me through that world. I'm I'm never going to see it. So, to start designing a game from the world first, um, that kind of that doesn't work for me. Like I I don't know how I would do that. Like I would want to keep things very, which is the opposite of the way I would write a novel. Like with a novel, I would just I could start with the world and be sucked into a sense of atmosphere and stuff. I don't think you can start a game with a sense of atmosphere. And end up necessarily with a good game. Uh, I mean, you have cool art, but um, there has to be that engaging game aspect <clears throat> that really makes you experience that art in the in the best way possible. Yeah, end up uh, kind of like a Sid Meier's Civilization or something to that effect. If you start with the <laughs> the world in a game first, I'm not knocking that. That that's fun too, but I totally get, yeah, it's not much of a story as far as the pace of what we're talking about. Well, it's like building a big, say, you know, a set for some amazing looking fantasy set. And then you bring people in that and, and you're like, okay, well now have fun. And they're like, <laughs> well, well doing what? Well, we, we provided dry ice and look at the cool things flying around in the sky. And, you know, well, it's up to you now. So I mean, you have to give players a lot more to go on than that than you know just a cool environment. But if the environment's not, I mean, I, the world is a big thing for me in playing a game. Like, I I love to get sucked into the world of a game, and um, I don't necessarily need a story per se to to pull me into that. But I do need to be, you know, doing all those game things that that are fun and challenging and and engaging and then everything else you know it all comes together i had a lot of fun with uh lord of the rings i think it was a playstation 2 i had a whole lot of fun with that because i love that environment but it's got a great storyline and i like killing orcs so <laughs> that's always a plus uh brennan you guys think before we can, uh, move on to the next topic sir no go ahead take us I'm just curious how you got into music because you 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 got your foot in so many different doors. I got into music because of the pandemic. Um, like, so we went through our 12 month lot or 14 month lockdown in uh, Kauai, and then immediately, you know, a couple months after that, the pandemic hit. So um, I was just stuck with nothing to do and. Um, feeling really tired of the things that I had been doing, uh, frustrated with, you know, I hadn't been able to sell the novel and 
So I was not exactly excited to write another one right away. Um, but I had a keyboard and I had a copy of Ableton Live and um, I hadn't barely touched them. So I decided to just start playing around and see what happened. I watched some tutorials on YouTube about you know, basic um, song construction, how to use Ableton and play around with the stuff I already had. And then I just got sucked into it. It was like, um, <clears throat> partly because I had no career goals. I had no history with it. I had nobody breathing down my neck and no expectation of what I could or couldn't do. I just felt this real sense of freedom. Um, and so I was, I do like a song a day for a while. And, um, then I enrolled in an online class, Berkeley College of Music, just to learn the basics of the Ableton. And um, so that was last summer. That basically kept me sane through the summer. Um, and then around the end of the summer, I moved. Uh, so I'm in, I'm in Los Angeles now. So I had a few months where I didn't do anything. I was just kind of, uh, everything was changing and I was moving around. And then, um, now I've been just setting up, I've got sort of a mixed, it's an office for writing and for music. And um, as the pandemic ends, uh, now I found myself, I'm, I'm in two music classes at the same time. So just as I can go outside again, um, I have a bunch of homework. <laughs> but uh, no, I really enjoy it. And I don't really, um, it, it's kind of a storytelling medium for me, like some mm -hmm. of the stuff that I've done that's kind of been the thing I fall back on. Like I, I like to have a sense of structure, like there's characters and there's a story and there's kind of a nugget to it. But, um, I, one thing that I find irresistible about it is if I'm, first of all, I've got 50 years of self expectation about writing. And if I, when I sit down to write, I've got all that, on my shoulders and um, career expectation and expression expectation, all the stuff that's like just baggage. And I've never really sat down where I didn't know what I was going to write. And I just felt like I was just going to throw words out and see what happened. Um, like I, I don't sit down and do that. I have to have an idea. And usually what finally gets me past the, resistance to sit down and write is because I have an idea for a story and I can see enough of it that I know where to go with it. And I have some confidence that if I start, I'll finish. <clears throat> so I need at least that much to write, but, uh, with music, I can sit down at the keyboard and like just pick an instrument and start hitting some keys. And within a few minutes, I'm already all I'm like, Oh, I like how that sounds. And then, and I like how that sounds on, if I mix that with it and I change this and suddenly I'm just in this creative process and um, I've made something. And I had no idea when I sat down what I was gonna make, but um, that just carries me along. I mean, I, I think about how awesome it would be if writing were like that for me, where I'm just gonna write some random words and I like the way those words fit together and hey, who knows, turn into a story, how about that? So that's never happened. <clears throat> but with music, uh, it happens all the time. So uh, in terms of creative freedom, I just um, never really felt anything like it. So, and, 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 there, and there's no point where I'm going, oh, well, maybe I'll be professional and turn it into like that, where it suddenly has this whole other weight on it. So I don't have to do that. It's just fun. That's great. Brandon, you're the music guy. I'm just, you know, I'm thinking how nice it is to have that creative outlet with no pressure. I mean, yeah. it's just, you can't, you can't put a price on how valuable that is to be able to, uh, w with no pressure and no expectation, because you can sit down and write saying this just for me, but I mean, people know you as a novelist. So as soon as you sit down to write, there is a certain expectation that at some point you're going to present that to the general public where, you know, having that outlet where it's like, this is just for me. That's excellent. Uh, and, I, and I loved your comments about uh, using it as a storytelling device. Uh, you know, um, Prokofiev's P 
Peter and the Wolf. I mean, it's it's primarily known as, you know, a children's story, but it's it's brilliant. I mean, the way that it uses instruments and themes to represent characters. And even if you just hear like a hint of a character's theme, but, you know, um, changed up in certain ways, whether it's speed or whatnot, uh, it, it just gives you a very clear picture of what's going on in the story. Um, and it's just, that's not a way a lot of people approach music. I think that's very in, an interesting way of looking at it. I think like the, um, well, I'll say I have a new short story coming out next week, uh, where it'll probably be out by the time this comes out, uh, at nightmare magazine online. So that's awesome. anyone, anyone who wants to read that it's called, uh, paradise retouched. And it's the last, I think it's the last story I wrote, but it's the last story I wrote on Kauai and it, it's set on Kauai. Um, and in the, in the space between writing that and kind of stumbling into music and starting to do more stuff in music, I think the next short story that I wrote, it was a piece of music and it's called uh, deep magnetic throne. And that's on YouTube. I did the like, sort of crazy procedural music, a video to go with it. But I felt like, oh, this is a cool thing to do. I wasn't trying to sing in that one. I was just doing voice over with it, but telling a story. So I'm like, there's great, for me, a great sense of completion in that. And I, my, like one of my favorite musicians was Brian Eno and his early stuff. He'd always, every song was like a little world, like a little self-contained cameo or world of like a little bubble universe. And those can be stories or they can be just textures or, um, you know, each one's like a little universe. So that really appeals to me. And for the flack that I've taken in my career over the years of not staying in a genre or, you know, everything that I do is, is too different from everything else in, in music. That's like, I, that's totally where I'm at. I, I want to find a new sound and kind of a new universe every time. And I, it's, it's the same way I am with stories. I, each story I want to be its own perfect little universe. Um, so it, it's the same creative impulse. It's just, you know, for now, I want to do both. And, and doing these stories and little musical stories is, is a fun thing to explore. But I don't, I don't put that burden on everyone. Like, you need to be a story or I'm... I'm done with you. So sometimes I just like to make weird sounds. <laughs> uh, we don't want to lose that fun, creative outlet. By <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you put too much pressure on each production. Yeah, exactly. yeah. You, yeah. It's easy to to lose the fun. I liked I liked your songs. The ones that I've listened to, they're just like pretty neat. Have you ever? Uh, I don't know if this is going to come off egotistical, but do you write and listen? <laughs> to your own music and write to that like write f fiction prose oh no i can't i can't listen to music while i write anyway so <clears throat> i wouldn't do that but i mean i i listen to my own music a lot just to figure out you know how it sounds but i when i'm writing um i music to me is always like a verbal experience i could never listen to music and something else even if there's no lyrics, I'm. It's almost. It's like I'm reading something while I'm listening to it. They they operate in the same channel, mm -hmm. so I was always envied. Uh, uh, at Valve, I would really envy the artists because they're doing this thing with their hands and their visual, working with visual stuff, and they could have music going all the time. But for, for as a writer, I could never have music going while I'm trying to come up with words. I just get carried away in it. I remember Phil Dick used to blast music while he was writing like oh i can't do that maybe when i was younger i would play stuff kind of like soundtrack for for what i was working on and i could do that when i read too like i uh I remember reading the william hope hodgson the nightland and i had a teacher in like junior high who had put together a cassette that had all the the full pieces that were kubrick's extracted for 2001 oh, nice. so it's Ligeti and all this weird super weird stuff but the full pieces and i would listen to that while i was reading the nightland and 
it made it even better. But I can't, I just can't do that anymore. Like I just stopped reading and I, I can't, I need to pay attention to one thing at a time. So you know, I don't listen to anybody's music while I'm writing. It's but, just popped in my head. Did you ever meet Philip K. Dick? No, no. Um, I know people who, who knew him or met him. And one of those ones where I'm kind of glad that I didn't because, you know, it might have been a great experience or it might have been a horrible experience, but I left leave well enough alone. <laughs> I just learned uh, like two years ago that Jack Ketchum was his uh, literary agent. That's oh, crazy. Really? Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, one one great author being the other's agent. That's that's pretty neat. I just noticed that you're wearing a City Seventeen shirt after an hour of talking to you. <laughs> yep. What's it yeah, say? It's, it's it an says, old one. Civil, so engineering. Uh, civil engineering, getting the job done. That's awesome. This is probably yeah my oldest shirt probably from Half Life Two. Yeah, is that? Can you buy that? No, this was like a team. These shirts were for the team. Yeah. And I don't know how many are, are left. They, there weren't that many made. So my personal view on Half-Life 1 and 2 was it's kind of like Aliens and Alien, where the first one to me felt like a horror sci-fi. The second one felt like a sci-fi action. Yeah. Uh, there were elements of horror for sure in number two, but was that a... Purpose? I don't know how else to reword how else no, to phrase that. I don't no, I there was no plan to to be that to be different in that way. It just kind of worked out that way. I think once we had a lot changed when we realized that the technology was now good enough to do these more convincing characters. <clears throat> like there was just stuff that we the characters became more important as soon as we could do characters. So um a little bit of horror a little bit of action, a little bit of comedy, kind of, you know, to be have a well-rounded experience with, with all these different sides of the characters who'd been very um, uh, cardboard cut out for Half-Life 1. Um, you know, when when we got to the point we could, they could actually move their lips and open their mouth, like just having them open their mouths in Half-Life 1 was revolutionary at the mm. time. So then suddenly in Half-Life 2, we're like, oh, they can shape their lips and form phonemes and their eyes can follow you. And we just started to take them more seriously and kind of want to develop them. So you don't want to subject them to horror for 20 hours. It's just, I don't know. I like, I, I like, I like a little bit of horror in everything. Like absolutely fine with me if everything that I read has some horror in it, but um, I don't read much just straight horror where, where it's kind of unrelieved. Um, and I don't know how we would have done that in something of the scale of Half-Life, like make every part of it scary. Yeah. You know, you stop scaring people. So it all, it's all focused on Raven Home in terms of the jump scare kind of stuff. and the, Those are creepy. The, creepy the gory creatures. zombies and, and all that. But there's little bits and touches of it throughout. Um, the first one was uh, isolated in the Black Mesa, so that yeah. definitely worked for you. Uh, yeah, it's, it's claustrophobic, and it has kind of the same mood, runs from one end to the other, and you're kind of alone through the whole thing. So when you were talking about the Miles movement, it brought me back to when I started playing Counter-Strike in 2001 or two, And back then, uh, I haven't played in years, but back then... The mouths moved, and I just remember me and my friends because I was I was a little kid, and we would just go like da ba ba ba, and it'd be the funniest thing because I I never saw it in a video game before. Um, that's really all I got for that comment. Neither had we. <laughs> I love it. Um, it was very. They were like, um, they were kind of like very low tech, like ventriloquist dummies. Yeah. So that you know they would just flap, and then. Um, there's there's a bug I think it's still in there that because it was just running sound through a channel and that, that ran an animation and when you first get off the the Black Mesa train at the beginning of the game and Barney walks you up to like the security pad and he punches in the keypad numbers the pad goes boop 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 yeah if you look at Barney Barney's going 
he's doing this along with it like he's <laughs> his animation the sound was running through his animation so i didn't know that that's when it that's when you see how crudely stuff is hooked up you know it's a lot of stuff really uh jerry-rigged <laughs> I think that's the beauty of the game. I played the. I, well, I do too. I I like the old, I like the glitches and the where you can see the you know, the flaking paint. That was so weird when you said glitches. The only time in this conversation you lagged for about a second. <laughs> um, embodying I, the glitch. I'm a '90s kid, man. I like the old 16 pixelated games. I like 8 bit. I like the. I don't know what the bits are for Affleck, but I like that stuff. Uh, the thing that I find interesting, uh, me and Brent are young writers, and I don't know if others think like this, but I think, am I ever going to create a character or a story that's going to outlive me by a long time? I don't know. We No way to know that right now. But with you, it's definitely going to happen. Half-Life has Gordon Freeman, and whether people know it or not, it's like Lovecraft, man. That's the first guy that comes to mind. Everything cosmic horror related has some, for the most part, has some Lovecraft inspiration in it. So I'd be willing to bet that Half Life has that effect on more than just video games. Um, I'm sure you've thought of that before, but I'd like to hear from you. How how does that feel? Well, I think maybe there's something in the DNA. You know, even if if um, I. We're, we're all influenced by stuff that we, books we didn't read and movies that we didn't see, but they're just kind of in the ether around you. And then there's, they have an influence. Um, <clears throat> I used to talk a lot about the influence of the books I hadn't read was as important in a way as the ones I had, like, because they, I had a sense of them. I, I, you know, there's books you go, I don't need to read that. I know what it's about. And yeah. they're just in the culture. And if you actually read them, you might go, oh, it's nothing like I thought at all. And then you have to go back and go, well, what was that thing? What was it that I thought I knew? Like that there was an influence. So um, I think there's probably, there will be fewer and fewer people who actually played Half-Life, but will know it by reputation. And I'm curious to know what that, what that reputation is, what they think they know about it. And what effect that has on it because in some cases those will be things that actually flow from the game itself and in others they won't have anything to do with the game they'll just be perceptions of it but i those will probably be more influential than anything that's actually in the game i after the game came out we really expected a bunch of people to do more of the same um the same thing with like no cutscenes and the, everything is delivered <clears throat> through action as you go through the story. But um, that really didn't happen. I think people figured out a way to apply some of those lessons to what they were already doing. And um, and that's totally correct. I mean, Half-Life had such a weird set of limitations that were right for that time and that medium and that particular story. Um, I really would not have wanted to wish them on anyone else because they were a weird set of limitations to work within. Um, but like, like any form, you, if, if you can figure out the limits and do stuff that's within them, um, that's, that's great. So it's when the most creativity comes out, isn't it? When you have limitations. Sure. Yeah. Oh, I'd like to know what are your upcoming projects? Uh, well, I'm looking forward to the world opening up again. That's, I'm, I'm not really planning much beyond that. I, uh, I went to a movie yesterday, and I saw In the Earth, the new Ben Wheatley. Oh, speaking nice. of Speaking of Blackwood and Mackin, and that's all in there, you know. Um, so, yeah, I'm, my, my next projects are probably going to lots of movies, and um, I'm in, I've got two music classes going on right now, so I'm going to keep doing some music. Um, I'm in L.A., so... At some point, I'll probably, you know, try to write a script like that seems obligatory. <laughs> uh, but um, hopefully at some point I'll get interested and in, have another idea for another book. Uh, and I'm always open to doing more short stories. It's just I've, you know, 
I've been been happy doing music and been really kind of busy settling in uh, to the to a new place. So um, haven't made any plans too far ahead. Lots of reading, playing games, watching movies, but uh, especially looking forward to seeing more movies <laughs> in yeah, theaters. Man, me too. Yes, me too. The last one I saw in theaters was uh, Bong Joon Ho. Bong Ho. Ho Joon. Fuck, what's his name? You Bong saw Ho Par- Joon? Parasite. Parasite. Yeah, that was the last one. I butchered his name. What is it? I got Bong Joon Ho. Yeah, Bong. Yeah, there you go. I'm not even gonna try again. Um, yeah, so Parasite. Parasite. So Parasite, it was a limited uh, edition. Um, and... I think I saw, I saw Parasite like in October, November of 2019. I was in LA seeing my dad here, and I saw Parasite and The Lighthouse like Ooh, back to back. That's awesome. And then, and then on Kauai there was one movie theater, and it played almost nothing. But so I think the last movie that I saw before pandemic was Knives Out. Mm. And then that was it. Uh, you know, that theater went out of business. Oh, man. So, yeah. and, you know, theaters have had a hard time. I'm I'm hoping lots more of them come back. So, I don't know, movies, that's my vice. Go sit in a the theater, watch a movie on a big screen. I can watch them on TV at home, but it's just, it's not the same. I agree. Yeah, the last one I saw was, uh, like you said, Parasite. It was a limited time. It was a re-release. It came out in 2020, February, I think. And that theater is not open anymore. It sucks. Yeah, yeah that's terrible. <laughs> what are you currently reading? I gotta, I gotta hear this. What am I reading? Um, I read. Well, I, actually, I'm not reading that much right now because I did a really, I did a bunch of marathon reading for a couple months. I read the whole Wolf Hall trilogy, and I read the um, the three brought the three body problem trilogy. I read all these trilogies that just like took over my life and then um i think the last few things i've read have been books about movies i've read a book about chinatown and a book about uh eyes wide shut and a book about uh brazil like kind of making of movie kind of books um and then what am i reading right now uh john shirley's new book just came out i i'm trying to finish what i'm reading right now so i can start that i just look at my phone because it's all my phone i kind of do a balance of um paper books and uh ebooks i'm reading a book about ai you look like a thing and i love you i'm almost done with that oh that Um, sounds interesting and then the new Ishiguro I have. I haven't started that yet. Um, I've got a bunch of anthologies. Best Horror of the Year, Sikorex's Daughters, some Adam, some Adam Neville. Yeah. Um, and then uh, what else have I got? Oh, these are ones I've already read. And then some some actual, I don't have that many physical paper books right now, but I'm going to finish the AI one, and then I'll read Stormland, the the new John Shirley. Rhonda J. Garcia is in Sycorax's Daughter. That's a huge book, man. And uh, yeah, we talked a little bit about that last is it, I, I have a I have it on Kindle, so I can't even tell you how big it is. <laughs> I just know that the file size is huge compared to other books that I read. Um, hmm, I, I want to say it's in the f- like 500 pages. But I, I don't know. Uh, could be Around wrong. there, it's a it's a big one. Yeah, uh, Brennan, what are you reading? Yep, that's yeah. yeah. Well, it's not that big. It fits on his phone. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's not that big. Your phone has more da- more more memory than than uh, the whole game of Half Life. You could probably yeah, fit exactly. a bunch. Could it could run a couple of versions of Half Life simultaneously? I'm sure. That, no that's, ins- that's so crazy. <laughs> And this is an old one. This is like a seven. I got a. I think I got a seven S myself. Yep. I think they're up to like twenty five now. I heard. I'm gonna buy. I want. I think I had a three, and then I got a seven. I think I'm gonna wait for a fourteen, and then a twenty eight. I'm just gonna keep going like <laughs> exponents. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> gotta keep a pattern to it. Exponential purchase. 
What are you reading, Brandon? Uh, I am reading. Uh, I just started Savage Season by uh, Joe Lansdale. Um, I have never read one of the Happen Leonard books, and I uh, when I read a series, I you know I I know the series is set up so you can start anywhere, but I got to go in order. I'm not mm. really capable of doing that. But he's just you know. I can't think of a better word than welcoming. You know, he he writes some messed up stuff, but like you you read, you know, page one of his book and, you know, he's he's patting the bench asking you to sit down right next to him and listen. I love it. Uh, And I'm reading uh, Shelley Campbell's Golf, which is really, really cool. I'm about three quarters of the way through that one. I think I have that one right here because it's got a really excellent cover, too. Um uh, so this Burke. is yep so this is hellhounds this is parallel dimensions this is losing you know sense of self and identity it's it's got a lot going on in there you got to pay attention to this one but it's really good i'm a uh, 76 percent through with golf because we're talking with her uh this friday i think it's one of the days are, of the week are you asking the, <laughs> the new convention of how how much have you read and you you give it in percentage. Like I'm the same. I feel weird about doing it. It's like, how much do you have left to go? Well, I'm, I got 14% to go. Like, it's just a weird way, a it weird is. metric for how far you're along in a book. Because you have no sense of how, I have no idea unless I go into a bookstore yeah. and actually look at the book that I just read. I go, whoa, that was huge. But it's more no accurate. Idea. It's more accurate. Because, you know, I, I could tell you. I'm on page 150. Well, great. What does that mean? Is it is it an 800 yeah. page book? <laughs> and then, well, do do you do this thing where um, go to the index or the afterword and figure out where that percentage is so that you can keep track? Like a lot of stuff I read has like 15 percent of appendices at the back of the book. So I'm like, I've only got to read this one to 85 percent, then I'm yep. and I'm done. Yeah. Yes, yes, I do do we, that. We have a whole new weird little metrics for reading ebooks now yep. that are they're we're being reprogrammed by them it's it's fun it, it's true it's especially it. when you lean into the non-fiction stuff it's like well you know it's i it says i've got eight hours left in this book but i know yeah. that you know one of those hours is stuff i can skip <laughs> yeah yeah there's three hours of appendix yeah at the end of this book <laughs> so i'm reading two cena palau books into the forest and all the way through and children of chicago they pair really well together and uh that's not to say that they are anything uh, light and happy. They are, they're dark. One's a true crime uh, poetry collection. The other one, it's uh, about police. It's not police procedural. It kind of is, but it, it, it gets, it's pretty gritty. Um, in case you have not listened to the last few episodes, I've compared Cena to Thomas Harris, one of my favorite authors. Um, her style's similar. It's not the same, but... She's great. Uh, that's about it. I'll keep it at three. Now, where can people follow you, Mark? Well, my website that I'm sure I'm never on is just uh, <laughs> markladelaw.com. Like, who blogs anymore? But uh, I'm on Twitter a lot. And um, I have a SoundCloud that's under my name. And I've got a YouTube channel that's under my name where I post music. Uh, I posted last summer. I did audio like readings i read the whole gorlin novel and all the short stories and then a bunch of my other short stories and i posted those on youtube and and soundcloud so you can if you like to listen to things on your computer or i think soundcloud lets you download some stuff um some point i need to figure out how to turn those into audiobooks so that people can actually you know treat them portably but for now uh they're online and then i have a band camp page uh, that I've just kind of started as I as I mix music so that it's a little better quality than what's on YouTube. Uh, I put stuff on Bandcamp, oh, and that's um, the the music name. It's UV Lamprey. So, but you can still find me under my name, or Mark Laidlaw. Go from Twitter. M A R C L A I D L A W. Um, <laughs> Now, if you want merchandise with my ugly mug on a coffee mug or a mask or a few other things, go to our website, deadheadspace.com. Click on the store tab. You can check out what we got there. Uh, Now, I want to know before we sign out, Mark, is there anything that you want to talk about? 
No, I think we covered it. Brennan. No, I, I'm going to agree with that. <laughs> Mark, thank you very much for joining us, man. Yeah, thank, um, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate the invitation. It was fun to talk about books and uh, and games. For yeah, I've wanted to talk to you for a while, so this, this has been a real pleasure and an honor, my man. And for those listening, next episode is with Shelly Campbell. We'll talk about golf, probably a whole lot more of other topics. Uh, and as always, you have many choices in podcasts. Thank you for picking us.